I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Hopefully you can hear okay. The next uh, hour or so, we talk about a lot of different things. If you have questions of either myself <laughs> or our speaker, Tom Rowley, feel free to stop us. If you have questions afterwards, uh, feel free to email or call the office or any of the advisors. We'd be happy to get back to you uh, with an answer or at least find out what we can. We definitely appreciate you taking some of your time to come today and take an active role really in your wealth management. How, how many of you guys have flown commercially in the last five or ten years, taken a trip someplace? Pretty much everybody. So, what was the thrust rating on the engines of the airplane? Because we developed our financial plans. We have to understand, we don't control the economy. You know, we can't control sudden unforeseen events. Just like the pilot didn't build the airplane. <clears throat> the pilot doesn't control the weather. Again, their job is just to deal with the circumstances as best they can. And even though technology continues to improve, we're still going to have unforeseen events. And in fact, I'd suggest to you with the kind of expanding media exposure, we're now in this 24-hour news cycle, uh, which has really become kind of Nickelodeon for adults, that they were being inundated with things. So it's not easy to sort it out. You know, the fact is, we can tell you all this stuff here, and it's not as easy as it sounds. Everyone says, buy low, sell high. Stay invested, stay the course. We understand that's, that's difficult. So, in case you need to run away, we'll give you our conclusions first, which, very simply, I think, over the next several years, regardless of who gets elected, you're going to see your effective taxes going up. doesn't mean the rates will go up. They may even cut the rates. But the amount of tax that you pay, we feel, will continue to increase. We also feel that inflation, not the number the government tells you, but what it costs you to buy stuff, whether it's groceries, utilities, trips, medicine, that's all going to get more expensive. We think at the same time, though, the equity markets, the stock markets, are going to move up, perhaps uh, very strongly. And then lastly, we think taxable bonds will probably drop in value. We feel there's, there's sort of a bubble in taxable bonds, similar to what we saw previously in dot-com stocks and Florida real estate and all that, that silly stuff. Um, the key, as always, though, is just to be diversified and to allocate the portfolio in the best manner for you. As a company, we don't use models. We don't have a set program for everybody. And again, we didn't build the plane. We don't have proprietary investments. We work with various providers, such as Invesco, um, to look for, for the best solutions to what you're trying to accomplish. Now, it's interesting. The government tells you there isn't any inflation. Does anybody believe that? Does stuff cost you more today than it did before? Of course it does. I mean, if you look back, right, from Kellogg's to Stamps have, have continued to go up. Now, the interesting thing is, when the government talks about inflation, they typically talk about CPI or CPIC, if you really want to be technical, the Consumer Price Index. The thing about that is, if you look at what makes up that index, food and beverage, about 14%. Residential housing, 42%. I don't know about you, but I buy more food than housing. And so what's been happening is, is housing prices have dropped it's offset a lot of this stuff. The other thing you notice, there's nothing in there for energy. Gasoline, that type of thing. It's just not included. So, the government clearly wants to keep inflation low because A, it saves them interest on the debt, and B, cost of living adjustments that are tied to this number will be smaller. So there's a vested interest by both parties to keep keep this number low. But the problem is, we can't plan based on this. We need to plan based upon real life 
and, and really, in our opinion, one of the biggest risks people are going to face is maintaining their standard of living in the future because things are going to cost more. The problem, again, is we're exposed to bad information. It's hard to make good decisions with bad information. And bad decisions tend to come by you. Although I do know these people, and nobody was electrocuted doing that. Um, clearly, we're bombarded with messages. I like this, uh, this is from a few years back, because you see your know, opinions change. Uh, this was from the Soda Pop Board of America. It says, how soon should you start hear your child? Well, not soon enough, because laboratory tests over the last few years have proven that babies who start drinking soda during the early formative period have a much higher chance of being accepted. So, clearly, that's got to be true. Again, part of our role besides play is giving you access to good information. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from, from our guest today, Tom Rawley, a nationally recognized speaker, um, giving you kind of a legislative update, but more importantly, I think, putting some of what's happening in context for you. Now, we've done these programs for 25 years. In fact, um, probably a few more than that. Some of you have probably been here for 25 years. And a lot's changed, uh, besides just me. <laughs> Interest rates, uh, this was an ad we ran in 1987. Uh, it'd be kind of nice to get the 8.6% CDs. Uh, but clearly things, things continue to change. They continue to evolve. One thing that has remained consistent is our vision and our mission statement for the company, which is simply to make people's lives better, whether it's our clients, our associates, or our community. Now, we understand as the political rhetoric kind of kicks up, it's going to be cause for concern. I mean, certainly there's a vested interest by any politician to either create a crisis or um, promote one, because that, that shows that we need them to do something. And I think you know, if you weren't concerned, you might not be paying attention. That being said, we continually hear, well, this time it's different. It's not different. Uh, different circumstances, certainly, but the process is always the same, uh, where people tend to get motivated by greed and then get fearful when the media tells them the world's ending. You know, right now we're hearing about things um, in Europe, we're about Social Security. How can we afford that? We're in a recession, apparently, coming into Christmas. And of course, nobody's working. Well, the fact is, we've been talking about this stuff for 40 years. It's the same story. And we can look at cover after cover after cover. So certainly, as we go forward, there are legitimate issues, but it's nothing that we haven't seen in the past. Now, one of the things someone asked earlier, so I added this, was about global changes. Something that's very interesting is a lot of U.S. companies are benefiting from the, the growing global economy. So it's not just foreign companies, but companies like McDonald's or 3M, Coca-Cola, Google, uh, Qualcomm, Apple, they derive the majority of their revenues overseas. And we think there's still you know, a lot of opportunity for that. Now, no matter who gets elected, <laughs> um, we stand by the idea that things are going to move up, whether it's taxes, inflation, or the markets. Historically, keep in mind that the past doesn't guarantee the future, and there's always uh, intricacies. The best combination has been a Democrat in the White House with a Republican Congress. On average, the markets return 9.6% over the four years <clears throat> of those terms. The second best, Democrat President, Democrat Congress, and then the third best, Republican President, Republican Congress. Um, but in all cases, pretty comparable returns. It hasn't made a huge, huge difference. 
On an even more positive note, if, in this case, the incumbent Democrat loses the market in the year following, on average between 1900 and 2008 has returned 17.8%. When the incumbent Democrat wins, it's returned 25%. Incumbent Republican, 35. And the incumbent Republican loses 21. But in either of these two scenarios, the numbers are still very good. What I would suggest to you is that's not because there's, there's all kinds of new things that are done. It's not because of the political party. It's because we start to get some clarity on the direction we're going. And the only thing the markets dislike more than bad news is uncertainty. And we have a lot of uncertainty right now, besides the political jockeying. Um, and we're going to hear about some of the things that are due to expire, due to change. But as we get past the election, certainly this year as in the past, we'll gain some clarity on the direction we're going, and then we'll see companies start to take some action. And so if we look at the fundamentals today, from a corporate standpoint, corporate profits are at record levels. Corporate cash is at record levels because they're sitting on it, waiting to see what happens. And I think the last thing to understand is it's very important to differentiate between what might be economically expedient and what's politically expedient. I mean, our political system is really at odds with our economic system. Our economic system says if you work, you get paid. That's capitalism. If you don't work, you don't get paid, and we don't care why. That's pure capitalism. Not say it's fair. Now, let's say we change it. We're going to be a democracy, and this table here is going to make a million dollars, and the rest of you don't make anything because you don't want to or you can't or you're sick or whatever. But now we're going to vote for a 90% tax, take 90% of what they make, Split it among everybody. How many of you are going to vote for that? Yeah, you guys. And then these guys are going to say, well, wait a minute. If I work a little less, it doesn't really kill my paycheck that much. I'm only keeping 10%. We're going to work less. So what happens? The tax revenue goes down. And what's everybody say? Better vote for another tax. See, the problem is the more you interfere with, with pure capitalism, the less efficient the system becomes. Conversely, while it's counterintuitive, sometimes when you lower taxes, you actually increase revenues because more people pay the taxes. And that's the debate we're seeing now is some of the social issues which become political issues as opposed to the economics of the thing. But from an economic standpoint, if you look at corporate America, you look at profits, things are very, very good regardless of what you think about um, unemployment and those types of things. The other thing that's always interesting, and I've done this going on 30 years, is people always look back and say, well, I wish it was like whatever the year is. I'd suggest to you there were a few times in history things have been as good as they are today. You can get mortgages for 3%. You can borrow money for next to nothing. Inflation's relatively low. Stock market's doing well. I mean, overall, things are pretty good. And I think people are going to look back on that and say, wow, I wish it was as good as 2012, 2013. But it always takes 10 or 20 years to come to that realization. Clearly, everybody's situation is unique. You know, we have a full team in our office. Uh, the the uh, six advisors, all of whom are here. Um, you've got Kale Schultz up in the top left, Mark Sperky, Nick, Ken, and Trent. We actually have five licensed sales assistants. I'm missing one of the pictures because uh, she just joined us two weeks ago. Uh, Bobby Berner, Rachel Weekland, Nancy Williams, Jane Toki, and now Roseanne DiVincenzo has just joined the office. And then we've also got Deanna, Marge, Rachel, and Becky. So you could call upon anybody should you need something. We do work as a team. And we're here you know, to serve you. So with that, any questions I can answer before I break apart? Guest speaker today. Good. And I get to eat some desserts. Uh, 
Guest speaker Tom Raleigh is a nationally recognized speaker. He's the executive director of Retirement Strategies at Invesco Van Campen. And I hope you'll find this as interesting and as entertaining as I did this morning. <coughs> Feel free to clap. Yes. <laughs> we'll do a little sound check when Randy's getting it together. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. What I want to do today is I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about two opposing political philosophies and what may very well be the tipping point between the two. But before I do, I always have to remind you that although well-reasoned and insightful, the opinions expressed here are not necessarily those of Invesco. Remember that past performance no guarantee of future performance and don't be silly, we don't provide tax and or legal advice. All right. Listen, I, I do this presentation, it's called What's Up on Capitol Hill, and people have said to me, in Washington, everything seems so confusing, so chaotic. They seem to be at such odds. In fact, I was talking to somebody who came up the presentation, they said, Washington seems so chaotic, everything seems so partisan. What's up with that? And we're like, what's up with the Capitol? That's a good name for a presentation. So what? And so, basically, I think that if you understand the motivation behind what goes on in Washington, it's easier to understand what they're trying to do and what they will do. So if you understand the motivation, it becomes easier. It reminds me of area codes. Have you ever looked at a map of area codes and tried to determine how did they decide which city got which area code and why? It seems so confusing, so chaotic. Once you understand the motivation, it's real easy to understand. When they were handing out area codes, everybody was on a rotary phone dial. So the fastest number you could dial would be 212. Because in the old days when you dialed one, you used to get the international operator. And, and so the fastest number you could dial would be 212. They said, well, we'll give it to the place that will get the most phone calls, New York City. Next fastest dial is 312 and 213, which is Chicago and Los Angeles. Now you look at a map of area codes and go, oh, it makes perfect sense. Alaska is 907. They were looking for phones. They were looking for phones. And so I think that if you understand the motivation for what is happening in Washington, it becomes easier to determine where they'll go, what they will try to do. And so for our story today, what I want you to do is, I want you to forget about the political parties for a moment. I want you to forget about the Republicans. I want you to forget about the Democrats. I want you to forget about all the politicians that you know. I want to take a step back and tell you about the two opposing philosophies and the economic theories attached to them. Now, the first uh, philosophy is the community society. The community society would basically tell you that the job of the government, the role of the government, is to be responsive to the social needs of the people. That really, the, the, the community society developed after the, the Great Depression. Right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in a sense, would be our poster child for the community society. They had gone through the Great Depression, and they said, we are never going to go through this again. And so they created the social safety nets, social security, the Medicare, and then your, your employer providing you with your pension plan. And in, in a sense, I, I don't have to tell you, but I, I did have to tell my kids. I said, listen, the Great Depression was way worse than anything we've recently gone through. I said to my kids, during the Great Depression, nobody got to keep their cell phones. <laughs> and my kids were like, what? How did they survive? I can't believe it. And my youngest was like, you were probably alive then, Dad, right? I said, nah. And so basically, the community society started with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, and, and basically, after the Great Depression, we went through this where we said, we're going to band together, and we're going to take care of the community. And the community society could be afforded after World War II, United States could afford the community society. Because after World War II, the United States was literally rebuilding the world, literally rebuilding Europe, literally rebuilding Asia. And if you wanted, if you wanted a, a steel, it was an American-made product to rebuild your city. If you wanted a crane to rebuild your city, that was an American-made product. If you wanted a plane, if you wanted a plane anywhere from about 1948 to about 1960, it was an American-made product. 
right? Because the Allies went to Germany after World War II and said to the company that was making planes for the Luftwaffe, they said, you can't make planes anymore. You can make cars, but you can't make planes. And that's why the BMW logo looks just like an airplane propeller is because they used to make planes for the Luftwaffe. And if they went to Japan at the same time and they said to the company, you can't make planes, and that's why the Mitsubishi logo looks just like an airplane propeller is because they used to make airplanes. So if you wanted an airplane somewhere between about 1948 and about 1960, it was an American-made product, whether it was Hughes Aircraft, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop Grumman, that basically it was an American-made product. And so we were literally the manufacturer and the supplier to the world. And so they could afford the community society. And so th th this went really well, right up until it stopped going really well. And it stopped going really well in the 70s. In the early 70s, you had the oil shock of the Arab oil embargo, and then inflation started to run, uh, started to gallop out of control. And by the end of the decade, you actually had stagflation. Now, inflation basically says, take your money, stick it under your mattress, come back a, a year later, take it out, you got the same amount of money, it will just buy you less stuff. That's inflation. Stagflation is, you got that inflation and your wages were actually going down or they were stagnant. And so in the late 70s, you had the stag, you had the stagflation where inflation was now galloping out of control. Uh, and, and at the same time, the wages were kind of stagnant or actually going down. And so that you saw the, uh, the sort of the rise up of, an, uh, of the new society, which I call the ownership society. The ownership society would say, listen, the job of the government is to maximize choice by creating efficient competitors. And so in terms of you, you saving for your retirement, that, that's your job. And, 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 and your health care, hey, that's your job. And how would they solve uh, education? They'd say, give everybody a voucher, right? The ownership society would say, listen, that this is not, the, the, the job of the government is to the, create efficient competitors and let them compete in a free market. And the poster child, of course, for the ownership society was Ronald Reagan, right? And so Ronald Reagan came on the scene about 1980s. He was former governor of California, but he became the president in the, in the early 80s. And he became, in a sense, the poster child for the ownership society. Now, I want to go one step deeper and talk about the economic theory behind them, just at a 30,000-foot level, that the, the community society is based upon Keynesian economics, which is all about demand. What they say is when the economy, the, the, what they say is the, the government, the power of the government, tasking and spending, should be used to help manage the economy. And so that when the economy starts to falter, that what you should do is lower your interest rates and increase the government spending. And what this will do is it will provide consumers with income and then it will increase demand. And so and, and, and the, on the ownership society, uh, society it's supply side economics. This is Milton Friedman out of the University of Chicago, right? Milton Friedman and the boys, right? If you were going to name a band, that would be a great name for a band. Anyway, but supply side, they said they don't look at demand, they look at supply. What they say is, listen, the government shouldn't, what they should be doing is hands off the economy and letting the free market run. And that when the economy starts to go poorly, what you would do is you would try to promote growth by lowering your tax rates and reducing regulation. By lowering your tax rates and reducing your regulation, what this will do is it will increase supply. And as supply goes up, prices will go down. And so you have these two different economic theories. And now the supply side economics in the United States, we used to call this Reaganomics, right? You remember Reaganomics, right? But the, the, the supply side economics, I mean, they were working with Margaret Thatcher in England years before Ronald Reagan w w was elected president. And if you don't know who Margaret Thatcher is, it's Meryl Streep. And so anyway, but basically, we've been running down these two paths for about 30 years, and we're coming to a tipping point. And we're coming to the tipping point. And one of the reasons for the tipping point is the, the 78 million baby boomers are about to retire, the cost of Social Security and health care rising, the high U.S. debt, and then there's growing political dissent, which is pulling from the center, if you will. Now, I, I, I'll talk about political parties in, in, in a bit, but in a sense, what we've got is a spectrum from the community society to the ownership society. But and, uh, on the far, far right, if you will, for the ownership society would be the Tea Partiers who would say, listen, the government shouldn't be involved in anything. And then on the far left, from the community society, you would have the Occupy Wall Street that would say, we are the 99%. We are the community. And so what you're seeing is a pull from the center as we have to make big decisions, which we will. But I want to show you a couple pictures, and then we'll go on to some of the things that will affect you and, uh, and us, all of us on Main Street America, as I say it. Let's take a look at the baby boom generation for a second. Take a look at this picture. 
And so, this is the U.S. birth rate from 1910 to 2004. And we've over, I've overlaid it with the generational name, and there stands the baby boom generation. The largest segment of American society ever. Born between 1946 and 1964. And the one thing I want you to take away from this picture is that there are more people in the second half of the generation than there are in the first. Now, when you take a look at the baby boom generation, I mean, they, uh, obviously, they came home from war and they were thinking about nothing but love, and the baby boom generation takes off. But if you were to divide the baby boom generation right in half, right in 1955, there are more people in the second half of the generation than there are in the first. So when they say, like, oh, the baby boom generation is going to destroy Social Security, well, it'll be the second half of the generation that will do that. And, and when they say, oh, the baby boom generation will destroy Medicaid, well, that's true. Okay, but anyway, so the, the other thing I want you to notice, if you look at the baby boom generation, you see that little peak? You see that peak right there? There are more people who will turn 52 years old in this country than any other age group this year. There are more people who will turn 52 years old in this year than any other age group. Right? I'm 52 years old today. I mean, not today. It's not my birthday. You didn't have to bring me anything. But, uh, so when you, when you think of America's problems, I want you to think of me. Right? Not literally, but just sort of figuratively think of me. Because I represent the height of the baby boom generation. And so that a lot of the issues that have to be solved, in a sense, have to be solved before our, my age group gets there. Right? And so that's the first thing I want you to take away. And, and I, I'll tell you what. The, you know, the, the, the experience between the front end of the baby boom generation and the back end of the baby boom generation couldn't be any more different. You know, they like to say the baby boom generation defined themselves at Woodstock. I was nine, mom wouldn't let me go. Right, and so basically, and so basically there, there's uh, the first thing I want to take away from the picture is the size of the baby boom generation. Now, the next thing I want to take away is what I call the valley of Generation X which if you were going to write a Western, that would be a great name for the movie, The Valley of Generation X. See, in, in a community society where each generation will afford the one in front of them, it becomes very easy for the baby boom generation to do it. It becomes very difficult for Generation X. And now, I told you right now that there are more people in this country than, uh, that will turn 52 years old than any other age group. You know what the second largest demographic is today? They're 22. So take a look at the echo boom. Now, what happens is, the echo boom hits that same peak, but the baby boom generation is much bigger. So the third largest segment of the population is going to be 51 uh, years old, and the fourth is 53 years old, and the fifth. So the baby boom generation is much bigger. The echo boom hits that peak, but it cannot repeat the baby boom generation. So those are the, that's what I want you to take away from this picture. This is the, uh, the, the next thing I want you to take away from this is this is the national debt clock. Right? And if you saw the Republican National Convention, this thing just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. And so I froze it right there, December 31st, 2011. And so right then, your family share was $122,295. So if you could get the checkbooks out, we could solve that problem. Okay, we'll edit that from the table. Okay, so, right. But basically, the, on, on the bottom of the picture, I want to show you, this is a federal deficit from 1980 to 2012. And I want to show you a couple of pictures because you tend to see this deficit a, a couple of different ways, depending on what they're trying to show you, right? And so basically, here it is from 1980 to 2012. That's a federal deficit, right? Now, take a look at these two pictures. This is, that is the, 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 the deficit based upon GDP. And the one on the far left goes all the way back to World War II. And so you can see during World War II, well, how did they fund the war? How did they fund World War II? Well, they sold liberty bonds, right? And so they, oh, look at the, uh, as a comparison to GDP, look how big it was during World War II. And so that's the, kind of the same picture here. This is a, the GDP, that is a fraction of GDP. And so it, suddenly it doesn't look as big, right? And then the other kinds of pictures they show you is, this is, uh, over there is the left, is that ninth, that's the U.S. budget deficit from 1993 to 2011. So it looks huge, depending on what the perspectives of, of the years are. What I want you to do when you think about the debt for the U.S. government, what I want you to do is think of one of two things. They are either trying to say it is like a mortgage on the bottom there. This is like a mortgage, you know, the debt, oh, you, you, could, you take out a mortgage that appears to be much more than you can afford, you know, when you're, when you're just recently married and you, you're making very little money and you have this big mortgage, like, oh, how are you going to ever pay this back? And, you know, you just keep paying it in 30 years, you've paid it off. Or 
They show you debt as a credit card, which is sort of the picture on the top. And they tend to say, well, listen, you can't continue to run things on a credit card. Now, it's somewhere between a mortgage and a credit card, and I'm not going to define it here for you, but what I want you to know is when, they, when people tell you and talk about the debt and the deficit, they tend to either say, they tend to either be talking about a mortgage versus a credit card. But any way you, 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 you shape it, having too much debt is a problem. If you have a debt that's a mortgage, but you can't, and the mortgage takes up all your money and you can't eat, that would be considered bad, all right? And so basically, this is how it plays out. Take a look at this. This is the U.S. federal spending for 2011, fiscal year 2011. And it's a pie chart. You see at the, pot, at the top of the pie is the interest on the debt, interest on the debt. Now, this is a pie chart, okay? So as one piece of the pie gets bigger, the other pieces of the pie have to get smaller. Right? And that's, that's how it works. And so there you have, you have the interest on the debt, uh, 6%, and you have Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, right? And so all, if, if you think about it, all three of those pieces of the pies are getting bigger. As those pieces of the pie get bigger, the other pieces of the pie have to get smaller. Or we have to make decisions about how big any one piece of the pie can get. So when they talk about debt, the issue is that the interest on the debt will continue to get, if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it pushes other things out. Okay? And so that's basically the, the substance of the issues there. Right? We've got the baby boom generation retiring. We've got social programs that are going to have to sort of expand right? Uh, because the baby boom generation is going to retire. And uh, you know, we, 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 we've got to make decisions. And so you say, OK. Couldn't we just sit down like adults and make decisions? Wouldn't that be the way to do it? And how come everybody in Washington seems so partisan and so angry and so arguing with each other? I will tell you that, take a look at this pie. If you're in the piece of the pie that's got to get smaller, what would you do? Well, you'd make sure that your interests are represented in Washington. Right? As, the pieces of the, as each one of the pieces of the pie, and that side of the pie, and this is a rocket surgery for crying out loud, I'll tell you, but as these, that side of the pie gets larger, the other pieces of the pie have to get smaller. And so if, you, if you're represented on that piece of the pie, what are you going to do? You're going to make sure that your interests are represented in Washington. You're going to get lobbyists. And so here's the total amount of lobbying spent from 1998 to 2011. You can see that it's just gone straight up. Now. The reason for that is as a country, we are going to make decisions. We were going to make decisions over the next couple of years that will affect us for a generation. And they know it. And so the, lo so the lobbyists have never been better networked, never been better organized, never been better funded because they know that the decisions that are going to be made with the coming presidential election, midterm election. Listen, we've got, we've got a presidential election coming up here, and I will tell you that nothing will happen between now and the presidential election, except for the political ads are going to get so mean, eventually it'll be like, if you vote for him, he'll beat your mother up. And you'll be like, oh, no, I got it. And so, and, and then eventually what they'll do is they'll just cancel programming, and it'll just be negative ad after negative ad. That's all you'll get, especially if you're in a swing state. I was in, I was in Colorado last week, and there's just nothing but negative ads. And so... Uh, but we have the presidential election, November. We have mid, and some of the Senate seats are up in November. We have the midterm elections in 2014. By 2015, we could have a president and a Congress of the same political party, regardless of which political party you're currently thinking of. Because right now, presidential race is sort of a dead heat, if you will, right? Right now, the Democrats control the Senate by six seats which is why each Senate seat is, you know, really, really important. And so that one senator candidate in Missouri said on radio legitimate rape, and people from his own party were like, get out, get out of the race now! Right? Because each Senate seat is really important. Right now the Republicans control the House, but not by that much. And so what, what we're coming up to is decisions being made. I will liken this decision that will be made, this we'll sort of, we'll call it a, a tax reform, to the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Tax Reform Act of 1986 decided things for an entire generation. Decided the, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 basically, you know, uh, gave the stamp of approval for 401k. Right? 401ks were invented in the late 70s, but the Tax Reform Act of 1986 said, 
Boom, 401ks, all right? Tax Reform Act of 1986, before the Tax Reform Act of 1986, everyone contributed to an IRA, right? You could put in $2,000, no questions asked, everybody could do it. Tax Reform Act of 1986 said if you make a certain amount of money, now it's not, it's not deductible, you got deductible and non-deductible IRAs and everybody said, oh, forget it, right? Then the Tax Reform Act of 1986 got rid of basically the oil and gas limited partnership industry, right? It was, there was a business and it was, they, they basically legislated out, they changed the tax rules. And so the Tax Reform Act of 1986 is somewhat uh, akin to what we will go through coming up. And so basically, and, and, you know, people say, well, okay, well, Tom, I still don't understand why they're so angry. Right? And this is my this is my, my my third point to the story is I call it politics, television, and entertainment. Right? If you remember 1980, uh, uh, Ted Turner comes out with CNN, the 20, first 24 hour news station. That's 24 hours of news. That's news all day long. That's news at all day long. That's they've got to continue to give you the news. And then in 1996, you have Fox News, which is 24 hours of news with a political agenda. And then you have MSNBC with his 24-hour uh, uh, news with a political agenda to the left. And now they have to fill 24 hours of news. And that's why eventually you're, you're watching the news, CNN, and you're watching it. And it's like, there was a house fire today in Philadelphia. And you're like, well, how does that affect me? Right? Last week, I was in the airport, and I was watching, and they had a, there was a car chase. And we're like, live. And they went to L.A. and there was a car chase. Apparently these two guys had robbed the bank and were throwing money from the car, right? And they weren't like, it wasn't a, like a hundred mile an hour chase. I think at one point the guy used his blinker to make a turn, right? And, and so, but, but they had a helicopter and it was live and I was like, this is news? I can't believe it. But they got to fill 24 hours, right? Now, to go on with my story for a little bit, I don't know if you remember, but in the late 90s there was a writer's strike in Hollywood. Right? You remember that? And so what happened was, after the writer's strike in Hollywood, the TV producers realized that they could make shows, reality shows, much less expensive than regular shows because they didn't need the writers, right? In a reality show, you just need the camera person and, and you just film and edit down to just silly and stupid stuff they say and you show it on TV, right? And so basically, and what was, what was, the, what was the first big reality show we had? Survivor. We're going to vote you off the island. And I would propose to you that every reality TV show that you see is based upon a competition model. Whether it's Survivor and we're going to vote you off the island, whether it's American Idol and we all vote until we get to the one winner, whether it's The Bachelor or Bachelorette where I'm handing the rose to the person I want, whether, you know, everything's designed on a competition model because competition sells advertisements. And that's how, the TV, that's how TV makes money, is they sell advertisements. So all of the reality TV is based upon a competition-based model. Now, the next phase of this thing, what I talk about is that much of reality actually has become entertainmentized, right? And so basically now you have, you have cooking shows, right, where they're competition cooking shows, right? They have two chefs on there, and you can't smell the food and you can't taste the food, but you really want your guy to win, right? You're like, yes. I mean, the, 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 basically, much of reality has become entertainmentized. Uh, real estate. I came home the other night and I said to my wife, honey, I just want to watch the news. And she goes, wait, they're about to pick a house. <laughs> and I was like, what? Apparently she's watching a show where people move to a foreign country and then they get to choose between the three houses. And so I said, so you're telling me we're watching a show about people we don't know moving to a country we've never been to before, choosing among three houses? She was like, shh, it's back on. <laughs> and so much of reality, like, uh, <clears throat> listen, I've been in the financial services industry for 25 years. I have yet to go into a financial advisor's office who's like screaming, you know the guy on TV, uh, he rolls his sleeves up way high, uh, Kramer, Kramer, and, so, and, and he's, out, he's on TV and he's, lights are going off and bells and whistles and he's screaming about winners and losers. I've yet to be in a financial advisor's office that is screaming at me or has bells and whistles in their office like, let me tell you about winners and losers. That basically what he's tried to do is he's made entertainment out of the reality of finance. And so there's been this movement to take reality, move it to reality TV, move it to entertainment, and basically, on a competition-based model, that is what our most favorite programs are in the country today. So, are you surprised that politics has become a major source of entertainment for 
with us in the United States. Because think of it now, the political parties now, basically, think of it from a TV producer's point of view. I don't have to pay any of them. They come on TV and they look really good. They know how to talk in sound bites already. If I have them for an interview, I can later use it in a newscast. If I have it in a newscast, I can later use it in the interview. And so, and, and, and now, I mean, even the, the political parties like have their own uh, colors, right? You have your team colors, right? Red states and blue states, right? You know where that red states and blue states came from? Tim Russert in 2000, in the 2000 election on the Today Show, he did red and blue states. In the 1988 ele elections, it was green and yellow states. But when he did red and blue, that basically was adopted, not only by everybody, but by the political parties. So you got your own colors. Heck, you have your own TV stations, right? If you watch Fox News, you're well aware of who they're for. If you watch MSNBC, you're well aware of who they're for. So basically, this has become, you've got your own team, they've got their own colors, they've got their own TV show, right? And so now you're watching. Are we surprised? Are we surprised that politics has become a major form of entertainment for us? Now, I have to tell you this, because compliance has me tell you this, the TV news is not a reality show. I just had to tell you that, right? I was like, well, are you sure? Because it seems like a reality show. But the TV news is a reflection of reality, right? Whereas reality shows portray an influenced form of reality using at times sensationalism to attract viewers and increase advertising revenue. Meaning what they do is they, 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 they rejigger reality so that they can, that it seems more contentious, right? They set up the positioning so that people seem at odds, so that they will fight, right? And so you're on Survivor, you create alliances to get other people off the island, right? In your race around the world, you're running with people and, you know, they, they just show you in the, hor the most horrible situations. Like, he's falling down in the airport, quick, film it, right? And so basically, Politics has become a national form of entertainment. Now, what I will also propose to you is the politicians on TV are negotiating with each other right in front of you, live on TV. That what they're really doing is they are negotiating with each other. What was our issue a generation ago? Our issue a generation ago, 40 years ago or so, our issue was all the decisions were made in smoke-filled back rooms. Right? And nobody knew who was making any of the decisions. And so what we all wanted was transparency. And so we've got it. You're watching the sausage being made. It is not pretty. It is not pretty. And so, you know, now they, they would tell you a generation ago, well, you know, the senators would get out on the Senate floor, they might argue, but afterwards they would have they would go and have dinner with each other. They'd have a steak and a drink and a cigar and they would work out things, right? And they say, nobody ever seems to go to dinner anymore with each other, right? And I would propose to you that one of the reasons that they don't is because the TV cameras are always on. And so if I'm negotiating, right, let's say that this half of the room has sent me to Washington to fight for them, and this half of the room has sent Randy to Washington to fight for them, what are we going to do when we get to Washington? What do we have to make it look like we're doing? We gotta fight for you. And so when the TV cameras go on, I state my position. And Randy states his position. And then later, do we go out to dinner? Not a chance, because the cameras are still on. And when we negotiate, you don't start in the middle at the table and say, okay, what are we going to agree to? No, you start out on your side, and you say, this is what we want, and we won't bargain with you. And they say, this is what we want, and we won't bargain with you. And then they go, okay, maybe we'll bargain a little bit. Right? And they go, okay, well, we'll bargain a little bit. And so basically, you start to have this negotiation. Right? The Tax Reform Act of 1986 was negotiated by the poster child of the Ownership Society, Ronald Reagan was the president. In charge of the Senate was the poster child for the Community Society, Tip O'Neill, right? He was a big D Democrat from the city of Boston who would tell you that all politics are local. The, the person in charge of the House and Ways and Means Committee was Dan Rostenkowski, big D Democrat from the city of Chicago, from the city of Chicago Democratic machine the community society machine. And what they did was they came about and they negotiated the Tax Reform Act of 1986 because at the time, in a sense, you could no longer go forward. You had to get a negotiation to move forward. We're at that time again. And what you may be doing when we vote is we may actually just be deciding which 
where does the center of negotiation start? We may be just, because you're going to see that the, the ownership society and the community society are going to negotiate over a couple of things uh, that are important to us, and what we're really determining is where will the negotiation start? So let's take a look at this. I'm going to take a look today at three things, social security, health care, and taxes, because I think that that's what really covers um, what will, they do in Washington covers us uh, in, in Main Street in uh, America. Now, let's start with Social Security form. Listen, anyone who tells you that Social Security is going to go under is wrong, okay? I could fix Social Security today. Another cup of coffee, because that's good coffee. Uh, the pencil, paper, calculator, I could fix Social Security today. The answer is simple, but it's not easy, right? Just like when I, when I talk about planning for retirement. Listen, planning for retirement is simple. If you put away a little bit of money for a long period of time, you'll have a lot more money saved than if you didn't. And you have to stop spending money you don't have on things you don't need to impress people you don't like. That's it. It's simple. But it's not easy. It's not easy. If it was easy, we'd all be millionaires. Right? And so Social Security, the, the, the fix is simple, but it's not easy. It will either be raise your taxes, lower your benefits, or a combination of raising your taxes or lowering your benefits. Or, really, you lower the benefits for the young and you raise the taxes on the rich. Now, there's a new test to determine whether you're rich or not. All right, you might try this when you go home. When you look in the mirror, if you see your reflection, you're rich. Yeah. <laughs> so, if we look at the Social Security, basically they began to use the interest in 2011. They drained the principal in 2023. The trust funds exhausted by 2036. You probably saw Tim Geithner come on earlier in 2012 and go like, well, you know what? We were probably a couple of years off. We might be three years earlier than this. <laughs> and we're like, ah! Like, what's Tim doing, right? What he's trying to do, he's trying to get, let's get the negotiation started, right? Well, listen, they're not going to negotiate anything until we determine who's going to be the president. Right? Because who's going to be the president will have a big determining point on which, where we start on the negotiation <laughs> process. So if we look at this and we say, okay, well, what would the community society say about Social Security? They would say, listen, protect the existing system. They oppose individual accounts. And they would say, raise taxes. Right? You pay your FICA taxes, which is your Social Security taxes. You pay them for 2012. You're up to $110,100. So if you make $110,200, $100 of your pay doesn't get Social Security taxes on it, right? Well, the community society would say, just raise the taxes. Just increase your, your FICA taxes up to $250,000. Social Security will be solvent to about the year 2057. Perfect solve. Did it. Right? The ownership society would say, no, 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 no. Let's go after the benefits, right? Now, this is from Paul Ryan's roadmap. Uh, for America, which I got to tell you, when we put this in the presentation, we didn't know that he was going to be later the vice presidential candidate. So how about that, huh? Yeah, looking pretty smart now, huh? Right? <laughs> so, so Paul Ryan would say, listen, if you're under the age of 55, you're allowed to put a percent of your payroll tax into your personal account. Why would he pick that group of people under the age of 55? Hmm. He has to. That's where all the people are. Right? And so what he's saying is, you're allowed to put a percentage of your payroll tax in a personal account. Now listen, Social Security works like this. You put in 6.2%, your employer puts in 6.2%. If you're self-employed, you put in 10.4%, right? But they're not going to say, okay, you can take your 6.2% out of the system. No, they're going to give you a little tiny, little, tiny, little percent, right? And listen, I'm 52 years old. I could put a little tiny percent of my Social Security in my account. I'm not going to have enough money when I retire to retire on this thing? You know why? Because they're not aiming at me. They're aiming at those 22 year olds I told you about. They're aiming at the next generation. So when they talk about social security reform, if you're, if you're collecting social security now, you're not gonna, they're not going after you. If you're close to it, they're not going after you. They're gonna redo the system on the 22 year old, right? Now listen, when I got hired into the, into, the, into the retirement business in the early 80s, right, I went to work for a pension and annuity department, and they said, we're going to go after this 401k business. And I said, what's a 401k? And they said, we don't know, but you're going to find out, right? And so I was like, oh, and all, and all the old guys in the office said, listen, this 401k, I'm never going to get enough money in my 401k for, for my retirement. And I said, that's because it's not aimed at you. 
It was aimed at me. I was 25 years old at the time. And amazingly enough, here I'm at 52, and most of my retirement money is where? In a 401k. And scarily enough, eerily enough, those old guys would actually be much younger than I am today, which is scary. Because, I mean, they, they continued to age, but I would, we'll edit that too, just right out there. Sorry about that. Okay, so anyway, listen. Gradually increase the retirement age, right? When they, when they changed Social Security, Alan Greenspan, 1983, was in charge of the Social Security Committee, the How Do You Fix Social Security back in 1983. And what they said was, if you were born after the year 1960, you can't collect your full Social Security benefits until you're 67 years old. Why did they pick that group of people who was born after 1960? Because they weren't voting. <laughs> Sorry. So, listen, they, the, the, on the ownership society, they'd say, listen, slow, slow the benefits, slow the cost of living uh, adjustment. Listen, in order to calculate your Social Security, what they do is they take your, all your earnings, right, and they adjust each year for inflation, and then they take the highest 35 years, right? And then they divide by 420, which is the number of months in 35 years, and they apply their AIME formula, and then depending on when you collect your money, will depend on how much of it you get. You collect 62, you collect it early, you get less, you wait till you're 67, you get more, right? And so rather than use 35 years, heck, let's just start using 40 years. If I use your 40 highest earning years, I'll dip back into your teenage years when you were making nothing, I average that in, you get less money, you can't even figure out how. <laughs> And when I announced that we'll do it on Super Bowl Sunday, about 2 p.m., by the assistant undersecretary of the transportation, you know, to an empty room, no reporters going, this is what we're going to do. Right? I could fix Social Security now. It's a combination of raise your taxes, lower your benefits, or really lower the benefits on the young, raise the taxes on the rich. Remember they said they would never tax your Social Security benefits? And then they did? Yeah. And so... Social Security can be fixed. It is simple, but it is not easy. The real issue is health care. Health care I can't fix, and this is why. Take a look at this slide. Here's a two-earner two couple, and they're earning $89,000. They're retired in 2011. There they are, looking out, looking out at Lake Erie there. You know, there they are. And right now they're going, oh, look, our ship has just sailed. Right? I can't believe it. No. And so basically, so basically this group, they, they paid $614,000 in Social Security taxes, and they will expect to receive about $555,000 in benefits. And you go, how come we can't keep this system running? Look, they're paying more money in than they're taking out. Right? Well, here's the real issue we have in America. Here's the number one problem we have in America. It's not really a problem, but here's the number one issue. You are the same age as your parents were when they were your age, except you're much younger. Right? The real issue is that everyone keeps living. Right? And so, and it's not that like you're going to live to be like 150 years old. It's just that everyone will live 5 to 10 years longer than they thought anyone would live. And so what happens is it destroys the actuarial tables underneath pension plans and underneath Social Security and underneath Medicare. And so the real issue is we're all still alive. And so what you keep your eyes open for, if the government comes out with a program to solve that now, okay, that one we're open, but anyway. And so, the, 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 and you know what, in Social Security, when they first started Social Security system, right, you would start collecting at age 65, the most common age to die was 64. They were like, this system will last forever. Right? And so our biggest issue is you're still alive. It may not feel like it at this part of the presentation, but you are still alive, all right? But now you're in Medicare. Medicare, this couple, they earned 89000 retired in 2011. They paid $114,000 in Medicare taxes. They will receive approximately $355,000 in benefits. Anyone see the problem? It's a huge problem. Huge problem. You've got the largest segment of American society moving into the time when they will use medical care the most. At the same time, the medical care is going up in cost. So what did we get? Oh, and so what happens is... The Medicare Trust Fund, they began to use the interest in 2008, they drained the principal in 2011, they, the trust funds exhausted in 2024. They need a 21% increases in taxes, a 17% reduction in benefits, or some combination thereof. And so what we get? We got the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which everybody knows as Obamacare, because the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the acronym would be PAPACA, and no TV announcer wants to say that on TV. I'll tell you that right now. And so basically, Papaka or Obamacare 
basically what they do is this is a community society fix to healthcare. What they did was you bring all the young into the system to pay for those who can't afford it and the old, where their costs will run greater than the resources. And so, and, and you don't, Obamacare doesn't really force everybody in the system. They just want their check, right? That's the individual mandate. You don't have to join, just send your money in, right? And so basically, if I summarize it like this, the community society would say, healthcare is a right. And that as a community, as a society, what we should be doing is protecting those people who cannot afford care and provide it with them. The ownership society would say, listen, Healthcare is a product, and you cut your cloth according to your measure, and you buy the insurance that you can afford. What the communities, and, and what they would say is, you, the ownership society would say, and the government should not get into the business of healthcare. What the community society would say is, listen, that the job of the government is to protect the social, or to watch out for the social needs of the citizens. And so they need to, what they're really doing is they are not legislating health care. What they are doing is they are regulating health care insurance companies. And so what they're saying to the insurance companies is, A, you, 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 you got to insure the uninsurable. B, if they, if they have a pre-existing condition, you got to insure them. C, you can't limit them to a certain amount of a cap for the catastrophic illness. And D, that men and women should now pay the same premium because women used to pay more for health insurance premiums than men did. And the ownership society would say, listen, that the government shouldn't get involved in a business that it, 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 that it can't get out of. The community society would say, listen, the government has a long history of getting involved for the, for the protection of the citizens. Hey, during the 60s, the, the government basically forced the auto industry to put in seatbelts, right? And the auto industry didn't want to put in seatbelts, and it would be costly, and it would be expensive. And they said, it will save and protect lives. The ownership society would say, rather than look at the auto industry and your seatbelts, take a look at Amtrak and the post office that the government shouldn't get involved in a business that it cannot get out of, and that one that becomes dependent on it for its very existence. That if the government was to stop funding Amtrak, that Amtrak wouldn't exist. And so then basically, so there's our, there's our this, is a, this is a question of values and society priorities, not government policy. And so basically, what, in the summer of this year, the Supreme Court came out and said, they upheld that the, that the government could do it. They didn't say this is a bad law. They didn't say it's a good law. They said that, yes, the government could tax you for this purposes, right? And so, so how, how is Obamacare now? It's going to be funded by a variety of taxes and offsets. There's a 3.8% on the incomes above 250000 There's the 0.9% additional Medicare tax. There's the taxes on the pharmaceutical and the high diagnostic equipment, which more than likely those companies will pass right on to the consumer. And then, of course, the one that really made me mad was the 10% federal sales tax on indoor tanning services. I was like, dude, what up? Oh, hey, whoa now. I don't use tanning services. This is a natural glow for me, all right? So, basically, you've got, you've got Obamacare, and listen, to take a look at the presidential candidates, uh, Romney put in Romney Care, if you will, in Massachusetts, right? And the difference between Romney Care of Massachusetts and Obamacare for, on, the, on, on a federal level, uh, it's, I mean, it's just, the, the differences are like shades of gray. I mean, not like 50 shades of gray, mind you, but just a couple of shades of gray. And so, basically, <laughs> That what Romney would say, what the ownership society would say is, uh, if we're going to do this, we shouldn't be doing it on a federal level. We should push it down to the state level and let the states decide. You know, I started out the, the, the story with, about the ownership society and the community society. I, I made those titles up for the two societies. But this is an argument that we've been having in this country for since its beginning. It used to be, you know, states' rights versus... Uh, we'd go back to the, the Thomas Jefferson... And Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton was a Federalist, wanted a strong federal government. And Thomas Jefferson was a Republican and wanted a strong state government. But the names, like Thomas Jefferson started the Republican Party, which is not the Republican Party today. Thomas Jefferson is actually the father of the Democratic Party, but he started the Republican Party. 
And then, of course, Abe Lincoln was, you know, the Republican Party, which is now the Democratic Party of today. So they mixed up the names, and I hate that. But anyway, <laughs> that what you see here is we're looking at values of society interpreted into policy. So the last part here is tax reform. Now, listen. From Washington's point of view, retirement plans Changes the retirement plan, all go up to tax reform. Social security goals goes up to tax reform. Healthcare goes up to tax reform. Everything for Washington starts out with tax reform because that's really the main job of Congress is to legislate. Uh, uh, to, uh, they can control the taxes, right? And so basically everything will come out to a tax reform. And so we've got this election coming up, right? Presidential election. And then we have a couple of senators uh, this time. Then we have the midterm elections. And you'll see sort of a, a, a compromise. So if we look at tax reform, now, all of the Bush tax cuts will expire at the end of the year, officially at the end of the year. So everybody's talking about the tax cliff, right? We're going to go over, we're going to go over the cliff. Ah. And I would tell you that it's, rather than a cliff, I would tell you that it's more like an obstacle course. That really what will happen is, if Obama gets elected, he's got this period of time between the end of the election and the end of the year to start to negotiate over these, right? And if he wins, what he gets to say is, Let's negotiate. If Romney wins, and depending on how, uh, how Congress plays out, there's time before the end of the year to negotiate it, right? And when I say that, I mean like, okay, you, you take a look at it, you go, oh, you want, you want the capital gains tax? Well, that's great, but, you know, like, well, let's get rid of the estate tax. And people will be like, oh, the politicians will be like, oh, well, dead people don't vote. Well, not except in the city of Chicago, but they don't. Have. And so, you know, maybe we'll give that up. And so what will happen is you'll see negotiation. And it won't be sort of an all up and down. It'll start to be a negotiation. Which one do you want? What will we get for it? And so you have this period of time. Now, one of the things, we, one of the things that we always ask for, we want Congress to act, right? We want them to do something. Let's be very careful what we ask for, because they may very well do something. And that doesn't mean that they'll do something that you want, right? That if you look at this, that the, the, the cliff will take effect. It will take effect for your taxes in 2013, which will be due in April of 2014, right? But, so be aware that, you know, they say like, oh, if Congress doesn't do anything, there's a recession. But if Congress does something, there's what? Right? Let's be very careful. But more than likely, they will come down and they will start to negotiate the various aspects of this. And they will negotiate sort of everything else we've been talking about. Right? That what you're really seeing is negotiation. What Capitol Hill wants to do is they want to broaden the tax base and get rid, to, get rid of loopholes. Right? Because we go, yeah, we hate loopholes. Yeah, loopholes are bad. Right? What's the number one used tax loophole in America today? Your home mortgage deduction. Number two? Retirement plan contributions. People are like, oh, that's not a tax deduction. That's my 401k contribution. <laughs> I need that, right? And so basically, like, Bowl Simpson came out. So what they want to do is they want to broaden the base. So what, what Mitt Romney was saying in the, in, the, in the debates the other day is he said he would lower taxes but get rid of deductions so that you may end up paying more taxes. You may end up paying less taxes. So don't be surprised that if they do that, they go, wow, that's exactly what we want, that your tax bill doesn't go up. Right? They could lower your tax bill, get rid of your deductions, and overall your taxes could go up. Right? So what they want to do is they want to broaden the base and, and, and target deductions. So Bull Simpson comes out, and everybody says, like, oh, Bull Simpson, what a big failure. The super committee, the, you know, the, the gang of six, what a big failure. What I would tell you is a year before the election, they're negotiating. They know November 2012, there's an election. They know that whoever wins the election, starts to get to pull the debate in their direction or their direction. So Bull Simpson comes out with a bipartisan plan that they don't take up, but that's surprising because, well, if this side wins, the negotiation could go that way. If this side wins, the negotiation could go that way. And so, and, and, and they're negotiating. Paul Ryan comes out with the Roadmap for America and basically says, listen, tax rates 10, 25%, no deductions of any kind. Boom, baby, right? Because if he was a rap star, he'd go like 10, 25, no deductions, boom, and he would drop the microphone. But he's not a rap star, he's the vice presidential candidate, right? And he's a representative for Wisconsin. But basically, what he said is tax rates of 10 and 25% and no deductions of any kind. 
So do we believe, so Paul Ryan would say that, he'd be like, boom, baby. And then the community society would say, wait a minute, aren't we concerned that the larger segment of American society is moving closer and closer and closer to retirement and not many of them seem to be prepared? Shouldn't we allow for the retirement deductions? Right? How many people saw Bill Clinton get on TV and say, you know, I think that the Bush tax cut should be extended for a year. And everybody was like, that Bill Clinton, he's talking out his ear, I can't believe it, right? Bill Clinton knows exactly what he's saying on TV, right? And what he's doing is he's providing cover for the negotiations. So Bill Clinton could get on TV and say, well, I don't know, you know, I think that those tax cuts, we could extend those for a year. It allows everybody to move one step closer and go, that's that Bill Clinton, okay, that's gonna do it, yeah, okay. And so what you're seeing is negotiation. And what you're seeing is right in front of you on TV. A generation ago, they would have all done it in a smoke-filled back room and nobody would have known the answer. We all ask for transparency, we've got it, right? And so the tax reform, more than likely, they could roll everything into the tax reform because when you roll it into a big tax reform, nobody knows who did what. There's a bunch of trade-offs, and a lot of the trade-offs don't kick in for several years, and so you wouldn't know, right? And so as I summarize it here, I say, listen, we've got the community society and the ownership society. What are we going to choose? Are we going to strengthen or are we going to transition? Traditionally, in this country, what we do is we transition the young and we strengthen for the old. And so before I take questions, because I, I always say that I'd like to, I, I can certainly entertain your questions, which doesn't mean I'll answer many of them, I'll just entertain them. All right? and I'd like you to summarize this by reading this statement. Sometimes, although confusing, you can actually understand the underlying story without everything spelled out exactly correct. I encourage you to stay focused on the message, the future is unknown. This is what I believe. No matter what happens in Washington, you will have a strategy here on Main Street. I, whether, it's a, you know, whether it's a Roth IRA, whether it's a traditional IRA, whether it's a, a state plan, there are always strategies to, for, for whatever they do in Washington. And so I can't, I can't accurately predict what will happen in Washington, but I will tell you that we're at a time where what we're really deciding here is where will the center of negotiations be? It will depend on who wins. And who, who wins depends on votes. I don't care how much money they spend on ads. This thing comes down to votes. If you don't believe me, Ask Al Gore. Now what I'd like you to do is put your hands in a pre-clapatory position. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back up Randy Carver so we can ask any, entertain any questions we have from the audience. I'm Tom Riley. Thank you for your time.